Virgil and Isaiah. War and its evils had come again to Jerusalem and to Rome. Ambitious leaders fighting for power had brought upon their people the horrors and bloodshed of civil war. Would war never cease, cried the Roman people. Would the temple of Janus never be closed again? Would there never be another golden age? The Jewish people, in the midst of bloodshed, uttered their age-old cry for a Messiah. Oh, when, when would that promised king arise to save them from their enemies and establish the kingdom of God? Seven hundred years they had been waiting for him. Seven centuries ago, when Rome had been a young, scrawny village, Jerusalem had been old and her people disheartened. It was then that the great prophets had first given the Jewish people hope of a Messiah. In time, they had said, a great Savior King, anointed by God, would be sent to rescue them from war and destruction. The age of the Messiah, as the prophets pictured it, was to be a golden age, very like the long-lost age of Saturn, which the Roman held as an ideal but now despaired of ever seeing repeated. Four summers had now passed since Caesar's death, which was supposed by those who killed him to restore peace and order to the Republic. Instead, a war of revenge had followed. At the Battle of Philippi, Caesar's murderers had been defeated, but still peace and order had not come to Rome. Trouble between the two men who had won the battle had been stirred up by Antony's wife, Fulvia, thus bringing on more bloodshed. Though Fulvia had died before Antony had returned from Egypt, the quarrel she had started with Octavian did not die so easily. Fearful that war between them would continue, friends used every effort in argument and finally brought the two men to a peaceful understanding. That was a day of jubilation for the Roman people. It was in October at Brundisium, in front of cheering crowds on shore, before the fleet and the armies, that the two leaders, Antony and Octavian, were seen to clasp hands and exchange the kiss of peace. To a young poet of Rome, by the name of Virgil, that day seemed to mark the dawn of a new golden age. The words he used to describe it sound strangely similar to those spoken by the prophet Isaiah seven hundred years before to predict the peaceful age of the Messiah. Virgil may have read Isaiah, for the Jewish Bible had long since been translated into Greek. One cannot be sure where ideas come from, for they know no barriers of time or space. Once more, Virgil says, the golden age is here. Once more, kind Saturn reigns, and from high heaven descends the firstborn child of promise. The age of iron in his time shall cease, and golden generations fill the world. For thee, fair child, the lavish earth shall spread thy earliest playthings, trailing ivy wreaths and wild acanthus smiling in the sun. The goats shall come on called, weighed down with milk, nor lions roar affright the laboring kind. The treacherous snake and the deadly herb shall die. The field shall thrive on herald, vines on pruned, and stalwart plowmen set their oxen free. Wool shall not need the dire skillful art, but lambs be clothed in scarlet as they feed. Come then, dear child of gods, Job's mighty heir. Begin thy high career, the hour is sounding. See, in the dawning of a new creation, the heart of all things living throbs with joy. These words from Virgil's poem may still be read in Latin, as in 40 BC they were read for the first time. And here are the far, far older words of Isaiah which had then been read in Hebrew for centuries in the Jewish synagogue. 
a child would be born, said Isaiah, to sit upon the throne of Jerusalem, to be called the Prince of Peace, and to judge among the nations that they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The wolf also shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and bear shall feed. Their young ones lie down together, they shall not hurt nor destroy, and all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In those long-ago days of Isaiah, when Rome had been but a village, the people of Jerusalem had been under the rule of the Assyrians. So far they had escaped the dreadful fate of the ten tribes to the north of them, who had been robbed of their homes and driven into exile. But about 150 years later, the people of Jerusalem had also been driven off to Babylon. Their city on the holy mountain had been laid in ruins, their temple burned and destroyed. Far away then they had sat down by the rivers of Babylon and wept. To comfort them, the prophets in exile had revived the old hope of a Messiah. In his own time, they said, God would restore his people to Jerusalem, send them a powerful leader, and glory would be theirs. They had waited fifty years. Then the Persians, who conquered Babylonia, allowed the Jewish people to return home to Jerusalem, and they felt that surely the days of the Messiah must be drawing near. In hopeful preparation they had toiled and struggled to rebuild the temple, and even had a gold crown sent from Babylon to be used in the coronation. But when the temple was finished, no savior king had appeared to be crowned. Year after year they waited. The days of the great prophets had gone. Still the hopes in a Messiah would not die. It had been planted too deep in the hearts of the Jewish people. Generation after generation, in one form or another, they passed it on through seven centuries. During those centuries, nation after nation had swept over their country and conquered it. After the Assyrians had come the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and now the Parthians were in Jerusalem. Disappointment, oppression, hatred of their conquerors had made them bitter and eager for revenge, and it had changed their idea of the Messiah. Instead of wishing for a prince of peace, Many, like the rebels of Galilee, were looking for a ruthless conqueror to arise, one who would drive out the Romans, wipe out the Parthians, a powerful king, a warrior, a man of vengeance who would tread down his enemies and trample upon them in his fury. And yet in Jerusalem, in Galilee, and all over Palestine, the people were still hearing read to them Isaiah's great vision of a world at peace. A vision now also caught in words of sunlight by Rome's greatest poet and the one most pure in heart. <laughs>